everybody. Um, I'm, thank you for coming. I'm Jan Fleckenstein. I'm the president of the USC Citizens for Land Stewardship. And just to tell you a little bit about us, the uh, USC CLS is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization, and our miss it mission is to encourage the careful conservation and stewardship of township and to foster an awareness of the importance of these natural resources for this and future generations. So you can see that the current quest course we're sponsoring, land use planning, understanding the pieces of the puzzle, is extremely appropriate to our mission. It was exciting and energizing to plan this program, and it's truly a pleasure to be here tonight to kick off this dynamic program with all of you. I'm so pleased that you all came, and um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our USC High School International Baccalaureate students. Um, eight students are, I think seven students are with us tonight, their instructor, Dean Austin. And um, the students, a different group of students is going to attend each and every program and then they're going to take the knowledge they gain back to the classroom and share it with their fellow students. So this is very exciting. We're really glad you guys are here. Um, right now is an especially appropriate time to enhance our collective understanding of land use planning. Upper St. Clair is currently involved in the pre-schematic planning process for Boyce Mayview Park. And in the next year or so, Upper St. Clair is going to embark upon reviewing and updating the community-wide USC Comprehensive Plan. The knowledge we gain over these next several weeks as students of land use planning will help us all to be more informed and more active and participate at a higher level in those planning processes. Um, with the Boyce Mayview Park planning process ongoing, CLS, we work really hard to stay abreast of and involved in the park planning process. If you're interested in more detailed information about the current status and activities related to the park planning, please talk to one of our board members after the presentation this evening and they can bring you up to date. So would our board members, would you raise your hand so everybody knows who, so if you have any questions, talk to these folks, okay? And I have, to, I have to thank some people. There's no doubt about it. We'd like to acknowledge the Upper St. Clair Community Co Foundation who sponsors and administers the program. Their hard work makes these Quest programs available to the community two times a year. We have to thank Annette and her husband, Preston, who couldn't be here tonight without, they, they work very, very hard to make this program possible. And special thanks go to our Vice President, Jeff, because he, helped tons. It is, this wouldn't be the success it is without them. And um, with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for the evening. We have with us tonight an expert in the field of community planning. We are deeply grateful to Mr. Jim Paschett for volunteering his time to speak to us tonight. Jim earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Landscape Architecture from Penn State University and an MBA from the University of Pittsburgh. Jim is the president of Pashik Associates, the landscape architecture and community planning consulting firm he founded in 1986. Pashik Associates is located here in Pittsburgh and provides a variety of services, including site design, park and recreation planning, meeting facilitation, GIS mapping, comprehensive and strategic planning, and the development of land management tools. Jim and his principals in the firm have established the Pashik, Lawnet, and Burkle but I hope, I hope I said that right. Scholarship in Landscape Architecture at Penn State University for undergraduate and graduate students who have demonstrated an interest in environmental issues. Pashik Associates' guiding philosophy concentrates on sensitivity to the environment and awareness of our collective history. And Jim and his principals and staff are committed to engaging stakeholders in being good stewards of the land and improving the quality of life in our community. Please welcome Mr. Jim Pashik. What I'd like to do tonight, is this okay in terms of the mic? What I'd like to do is go through a couple things. I, I have a few slides that have to do with um, the big picture. What do you think about in terms of park planning from a community-wide basis? So I'd like to touch on that first because I think without that big picture and that vision, you really can't be looking at individual park master plans. Um, because I think you learn by doing, I'd like to stop after a few slides 
and just kind of go through a brainstorming or visioning session so you get kind of the flavor of how that's done as part of setting that vision for your community. Then we'd like to go back to the slides for a few minutes and go through a little primer on how to do master planning for a specific park site. And then I'd like to stop with the slideshow and actually then have you get involved in master planning a hypothetical park and we've got site plans and, and cutouts and things to do. So we're going to divide up into groups and you're actually going to master plan a park uh, for the last 30 minutes of the session. And then we'd like everyone to kind of report back to the group as to what successes or problems or issues they discovered as they went through that process. So that's the agenda for tonight. Uh, we've got a lot to cover in, in a short period of time. So um, are there any questions before I move on on this? By the way, I'd like to add my thanks to Jeff and Bonnie, great schleppers. <laughs> they, they really haul stuff nicely. So the, the, the state of Pennsylvania really sees uh, a lot of different kinds of planning efforts in parks and recreation. Uh, there are what they call comprehensive recreation park and open space plans. That's a mouthful. But it really means looking at, at the community-wide, at natural systems, at cultural systems, and at the needs of parks and recreation. And, and that's one of the things that we're starting with right now. There are then master plans, there are feasibility studies, there are a whole variety of other kinds of uh, trail studies, greenway studies, uh, specifically open space studies. But, but the kind of thing that most communities start with in terms of developing is a comprehensive recreation plan for the entire community. And there are a number of reasons why it's important to do that. Pepper here. Um, there are environmental benefits economic benefits, community benefits, and personal benefits. Obviously, I think we all can pretty much, especially this group, would know the environmental benefits of planning for parks and recreation and open space and community. We're going to be cleaning the water. We're going to be protecting ecosystems and, and reducing pollution. Those are obviously things that are very important to us and something we need to do as part of our community-wide planning. Um, in terms of community benefits, uh, there are studies that show that, that, that crime goes down when you plan for parks. Uh, we looked at the way parks and recreation, especially recreation programs, connect families in a way that isn't done when those aren't offered. Um, and we look at, at things like supporting youth and offering lifelines to the elderly. They're all really strong community benefits. When you say, um, I live in a community, these are parts of what a defines a community. Um, there are obviously some personal benefits to parks and recreation. There's physical fitness benefits, there's less stress, um, it eliminates boredom. Those are same, but the thing that probably gets the most play lately has to do with economic benefits. Most people think, well, parks or recreation are luxuries. You know, if we can afford them, let's do them. And, uh, and, and what we're finding is more and more research is being done is that there are actually some real strong economic benefits to developing plans and planning for parks and open space and recreation. Uh, oftentimes, really great parks uh, increase tourism. Anyone who goes to Somerset and rides on the trail, the Ohio Power Trail or something, sees the economic benefits of, of all the businesses associated with that trail. There's business retention. You go through the airport, there are posters by companies wanting to attract young people to their business. They don't show pictures of this poor guy sitting for 12 hours before a computer screen. They show a mountain biker. And they say, come to our company and enjoy where we live. And so even businesses are starting to understand the, the connection between quality of life and seeking out quality employees. And so there's just a tremendous business event that way. There's revenue generation. There's a lot of other economic benefits. This has been a hard sell. We're, we're finally getting uh, politicians to start to understand the economic benefits of park planning. Um, I've been in meetings where a politician will say, the only good park is an industrial park. And I think we're slowly wearing them down and getting them to understand that the quality of life is really a very important issue. I know I'm speaking to the choir here. I know you all believe in that anyway. So as part of this big planning, we, it's important to look at trends. Um, we all hear that we need this or we need that, but we, we need to look at trends to see what's going to be emerging because we're planning for 10 and 20 years in advance. So it's not helpful to figure out what it is we're planning for next year or two years. We need to really be projecting, and part of this Planning for the entire community involves looking at trends. This happens to be the trends participation rates, the highest participation rates of, of activities from 2000 to 2001, with snowboarding being number one, hockey, 
kayaking, rafting, scuba diving, sailing, snorkeling, canoeing. These are the top 10. I don't see a whole lot of soccer and baseball up there, which is kind of interesting. Um, so what is this plan? This comprehensive plan really tries to answer three questions. We kind of boil it down to very simple things. Um, if we can answer the questions, where are we now, where do we want to be, and how do we get there, um, we've done a good job of planning for the future. Uh, where are we now? Let's see. To answer the question, where are we now, we really need to look at what are the facilities, the programs, the structure to provide those facilities and programs. What are they? So we look at the community background and demographics. Do we have an aging population? Do we have a young population? It makes a big difference on the programs and the facilities. Um, the cultural resources, it's really, really important in the creating the sense of place in your community to make you different than any other community to understand the cultural resources that you have in your community, the historic areas, the, the special places um, that are created in your community because that's what makes you different than the 10 other suburban communities right around you. And of course, the natural resources are terribly important. We need to know what we need to protect in terms of natural resources and what we have. But we go beyond that. We need to know how do you administer and provide park facilities, programs, uh, are the programs are something that the Upper St. Clair municipality should be providing, or should programs be provided by an organization like this, nonprofit groups? Should there be partnerships with community college or other to provide services? How can we bring together a variety of resources in order to provide and meet the needs of, of the community? Um, so we look at part the structures of recreation, we look at the facilities. A community wide plan understands what all facilities there are, whether they're safe whether they're not safe, are they up to date, the facilities are the playgrounds meeting ASTM standards, those kinds of things. So that starts to give a baseline of where we are now. We now have a good understanding of, of where we are. Now we've got to figure out, well, that's fine, but is this what we really want? It may be exactly what we want. We don't need to spend one more dollar. We're perfect. I haven't run into a community like that yet, but we need to find out where do we want to go. So the second question, is where we want to be. And this is the public participation process. And I know that you've been through this at, in great length and detail with the, the Mayview site, a, a really wonderful process. And it's the kind of process we're talking about. And, uh, and the state looks at a whole variety of venues. Because oftentimes, um, in, other than the Mayview site, we'll have public meetings and six people will show up. Uh, we need to get as many venues or opportunities for public input as possible. So we work hard on each of our projects. So we have public meetings. We have study group meetings with concerned and interested citizens. We have key person interviews. We go around the community to interview people that might not come to the public meetings or be part of the study group. Oftentimes, we'll do a citizen survey to get the people who might not come out to a meeting but might want to have a say on what they need. And then we'll, we'll still feel like we've missed somebody. We may have not have captured the elderly, so we might go to uh, an elder, a, a senior citizens group, and, and have a focus group with them. We might feel that we don't have the teens. The teens are a hard group to sort out. I mean, you guys define what the coolness factor is, and it's a moving target. So we need to figure out what's cool in the community so we can meet the needs of teens. So we oftentimes will do teen focus groups. So as we go through, we identify the key issues in that process, and we develop a vision for the community. Um, and that vision can be a story. It can be a list of, of goals. It can be an abstraction of, of where we hope to be 20 years from now. But the point is, is that we want to figure out where we want to strive to in terms of that vision. And then we compare that to our baseline. So if we want an interconnecting system of trails and green trees to protect our riparian buffers and to provide recreational opportunities, then we look and see if the baseline is, are those in place now? And if not, how can we achieve that? And so finally, how do we get there, that third step? So we now we know where we want to be 10 or 20 years from now in that vision. And we also know where we are today. So now we have to figure out very specific steps to achieve that vision. And that's in, when I was starting to do practice in the 70s, this wasn't done. And what we found was that these wonderful plans were put on the shelf and ignored. And what we found is, is that by providing this third step 
of how do we get there, very specific. You need to do the following thing in the next months. You need to do the following thing in the next 18 months. And by the way, in three years, you need to do this and this and this, and this is the grant you need to get, this is how much you need to spend. That kind of implementation plan then, in fact, allows you then to have some success in achieving that vision. So those are kind of the steps that go through as part of a comprehensive plan. Uh, what I'd like to do right now, if I may, is to kind of go through and do a visioning exercise. Uh, how many people were involved with the, the Mayview process? So there's a few that haven't. So most, most two have heard of this. What I'd like you to do is to jot down on the cards that Jeff is handing out. Think, this is play acting, so think of this as we're all from the same community, which we probably are. Um, but let's let's talk about Upper St. Clair. What you would like to have in terms of parks and recreation open space in St. Clair. So the goal for now is for you to identify one or two or three great things that you like about the parks, the recreation program, the open space in this community two or three things you think could be improved in the community, things you wish would be better than they are now, or things that you wish we had that we don't have right now, something they have in Ohio that you wish we had here, something that you think that we are missing the point on and we should be doing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and have each one of you give me one item in turn, and we'll, we'll develop them on a list. So just jot on the card there a couple of things that you either like about parks, facilities, Recreation programming, open space, greenways, natural areas, or things that you think need improved. So just jot those down, and I'll explain why we do this. Do we need any more? have people, I'm going to talk, this is called the nominal group technique, it's a participatory process. The reason we have you jot them down on cards are, are, are really several fold. One, we hope by you jotting them down on a card, you're going to be a little more succinct and precise so that when you present your idea, you're not sitting there and giving a speech, but hopefully you will do something and read off the card. Secondly, for those people that are uncomfortable in public speaking, and many people that come to these meetings sit in the back and never speak, and those are people we want to find out about. And we find that if you have it written down on a card, it's a little bit easier to say, you know, I really like blank. And so it gives people who are a little bit shy about public speaking the opportunity to be able to do that. So those are some of the reasons why we go around and do that. The next thing is that we're going to go around one by one, we're going to ask you to give me one item. What that does is that it ensures that everyone in the room participates in this process, which is important. And uh, it also, we control the speech making. So to any of you that have been to public meetings have heard the system getting up and giving speeches, and we're able to control that and get as much information as possible. So I'd like to just go around quickly, and then we're going to get back to the slides. Then. So Jeff, yeah. give me one thing. terms of that, is there a, an action that you want associated with that? I mean, is it preserved, or, or there are some that you specifically like, or? Uh, yeah, probably just some planning, yeah, preserve their sort of uh, pride in Please. Um, I like natural areas, trails. Natural areas. Are you saying that we have enough or that we need more or? Well, I'm not really from around here, so I'm not sure. It doesn't matter, make it up. Uh, <laughs> doesn't yeah, matter, this is all game anyway. Yeah, yeah. Leave it up to you. Yeah. Uh, 
project preserve more? This is the right group to say that in. along the natural space in my community to enjoy. What was the first word? Natural. Natural space. Sir? I'd say a swimming pool, but not in Boyce Mayview. <laughs> More so central. So the need for a pool. This is mostly Boyce Mays. I like the undeveloped nature of the park. Uh, so that should be preserved. Um, this re relates to Boyce Mayview also. Um, having um, a station or an area where you can go that has uh, pictures of identifying trees, plants, animals, whatever. So when you take, um, you know, even just for adults, but also when you take groups of children along, um, you know, it's an easy way to um, play a game or help identify what you're looking at. Hiking trails. We have, are you, do we have sufficient or do we need more? Um, no, I think we're okay. We have good ones and we should preserve them. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Mine was an improvement. I'd like to see us improve our uh, walking access to locations in the community. Uh, so more walkable community. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think a park with any man-made structure to remain intimate and a personal sense of scale and not obtrusive to the environment. Structures that are proposed need to be intimate scale, not intrusive. Did I get that? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I'd like to see a place where we, you can allow your pets to run unleashed. Ah, we call those bark parks. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine was similar to Jan's, uh, having the parks connected by um, areas that are auto-free, so they're accessible. That's actually kind of a more detailed, parks that are connected. It's a nice idea. Um, I was dittoing all those, but um, I would like some historical integrity to the community and uh, for that to be preserved. And, and that's kind of a broad idea. What can you give me some more specifics on how one uh, maintains the historical integrity? Um, preservation of both natural areas um, and um, historic structures. Um, <clears throat> mine was touched upon by a couple people, but uh, maybe just to expand upon the having um, greenways, walkways, and bikeways throughout the community, and um, also I, you know, kind of bothers me almost every day when I try running or walking or taking my dogs out, just having sidewalks that uh, there are not too many in the community, and. Uh, it's tough to get anywhere without running into traffic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 
community garden. Community garden. Community garden. Yeah, I agree about the pool too. <laughs> Are there community gardens now? Uh, yes. In Boyd County, they really do. Great. Yeah. Um, I said uh, a quiet, peaceful green space with little trees or with little birds and big trees. How's that? Habitat variety. Back at the table. All right. Uh, to try maybe to get more playgrounds, not just have a quantity of playgrounds, so everyone can have a playground within their walking distance. Oh, what a great idea. So, neighborhood playgrounds. Easily walk the site. Thank you. Um, I I don't know if this was said, but there aren't many sidewalks to get to different places. We mentioned that here, so you you see the need from a walkability issue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can't pass? <laughs> <laughs> and you're on tape. <laughs> um, I thought there's a piece of back bars. Got to be more snack bars. Yeah, in the parks. In the park. Snack bars as in a package or as in a facility? At like a little store, like, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Ah, now we're starting to talk about a gathering place, some place to go. <coughs> Excellent. That's very important. Okay. Um, I think it's good we have a nice variety of different kinds of plants and animals. Even though it seems like there's only white-tailed deer, there's a lot of different, you know, animals there's around. There's only white-tailed deer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> variety of fish. So we should be encouraging a variety. Well, um, I think we need actually more trees for because I know that kids love climbing trees and we need more climbable trees. There are no none in this community at all. What a favorite image is climbing and sitting in a tree. It's a wonderful image. Thank you. Um, I think we should have more bike trails because um, walking trails and bike trails they seem to get mixed up. I think you have, should have separate things. More bike trails. And the idea is to separate from walking. Um, I think we should have like picnic areas in the park so you can like bring your own lunch ah. or whatever and just sit in like a nice space to eat your whatever you brought. <laughs> Great, thank you. I think we should have a unique tree planting so somebody can appreciate what our work 100 years from now. Wonderful. Thank you. So just a note about what went on. I mean, you guys all behave. You didn't even challenge me. Um, what we would do is if someone wanted to try and give two or three because they thought they were so important, I would probably cut them off politely. Um, the idea is now that everyone spoke, everyone's involved. Now, I hope you noticed that it's important to try and encourage people. There were some things that were repeated, but I went ahead and wrote it down because I'm trying to show respect for the person offering the idea because there's a building of a relationship consensus building. Because in, in the consensus building, building relationships and trust. And that's part of all planning process and it's very important. So I know I'm supposed to be doing this microphone, I'm sorry. So let's go on. Slideshow. 
So now we have this vision. We've taken all of these wonderful ideas and we've gone through and done a whole variety of public processes to come up with um, a vision of what the perfect park system and natural systems and cultural systems are for Upper St. Clair. So now we, we, have, we want to do a master plan for a specific part. And you've, you've all been through this, so this is probably old hat for many of you that have been involved with voice making. We have found in doing some of the parks that there are, we can boil it down to five key things that we think tend to set the project up for success. And, and I know Eric and, and his group has, have done all of these things in, in Mayview. They've done some wonderful things. But we feel very importantly that the process is as important as the product. Uh, for too long, we've had consultants come in. They've been told to master plan this park. They disappear. Six months later, they come back with the perfect master plan. And nothing happens. And there's no community support. Uh, people complain at the end of the process that it isn't what they wanted. Uh, and that just doesn't work. And so what we need to do is build a process where people are involved. They build interest that the plan reflects the community's interests in great detail. And that as a result of that, people then start to become supportive of that plan. And then when it comes time to help fund, when it's time for volunteers, when it times to get support, you're going to have that basis because they've had a part of that plan. And you've actually recorded. And they said, well, you know, on page 33, there's an idea that I suggested. Oh, yeah, it was scheduled for the year 2060. So, but but it, the fact is that you listened to what I had to say, and I want to therefore support your plan, and especially if it involves a tax increase, you're going to be able to get that support. So it's really important to have a journey, a process to go through. Ah. We've already talked about this in the comprehensive plan. It's just as true for the master planning, that we need to have public input. This is... Um, uh, interesting enough, for those of you that don't know, I've done this same kind of public process. I've done the same thing we did tonight in the Czech Republic. And this is in uh, Spalane Borici in the Western Bohemia, right, right there. If you were apt to look at those charts where they're putting the red dots or prioritizing, it's all in Czech. Although you can see skateboard is the same skateboard in Czech, too. <laughs> we feel very strongly that unless you want to rubber stamp everything that everyone else has, it's critically important that you connect to your local culture and history. I, I think you just cannot emphasize that enough, or it's going to be exactly the same plan as Mount Lebanon and Peter's. And what you have is a really special community, and you need to celebrate that in a way that no one else can. And you can only do that by focusing on the culture or historic story that you want to tell about your community. This is a tough one. This is one we have probably the biggest struggle. Um, how do you balance the demands for facilities with the need to preserve natural resources? I don't have the answer yet. So if anyone here has the answer, I'd love to know it for the next project. Uh, but obviously, that's one tension that we always have to struggle through in many projects we have is what is that balance of active sports, which are needed, and in western Pennsylvania, there's very few flat spaces. So wherein there is a flat space, they want to put a field on it with the preservation and the protection of habitat and natural resources. And, and this one, I think most people are in here are very understanding about, is the need to design and lay out facilities that respect the land. You need, if you've got a wetland, you need to think that that's an incredible asset, not something to pipe or cover. I mean, you need to celebrate that wetland because that's the breathing part of our green earth. We need that. Um, you need to do parking and road improvements that, in fact, follow the contours of the land and not up and over um, and, and destroy the, co the contours and the topography. Um, you need to build the facilities in a way that doesn't require high walls. Um, for anybody who knows coals on the way to Monroeville, you can imagine the high retaining walls. I mean. I'm not sure that really needed to be in that spot. Uh, and what we don't want to do is encouraging that kind of intrusion into the environment. We need to say the environment cannot support it. We need to find another place. So if we can do all those five, you're going to have a great master plan. So how do we do this? So we've talked about the big picture. This is one big puzzle. 
preparation of a base map. Um, how, how, how many are able to read a, a two-dimensional topographic plan, you know, with the contours and everything? Oh, great. We're going to break the U up so that you're all at, at a different table so we can help the others. We do base maps that represent existing conditions. And um, afterwards, if you want to come up and look at some of these or the maps you'll have, we represent the contour land, the hills and valleys, by little lines called contour lines. The closer the contour lines get, the steeper it's represented. So as you look on these areas where the contour lines get closer, that's a steep area and you want to stay away from that area. If it gets wider, then you can think about doing other things. It shows where the trees are. If they've got a, a blue line with dashes, it's a drainage way. You know that it's going to be wet there, so we want to stay away from that area. We may want to cross it if we have to, but we don't want to disturb that area and we want to provide a buffer to protect that drainage way. Uh, if there are green squiggle lines, usually that means tree masses. So we want to think about whether we want to intrude in that tree mass, at least ask our question, is that a, a quality tree grove? And we want to preserve that so eventually we have trees to climb up into or not. So then we do what planners call analysis. We go out, we look at the site, we walk around, we thump around, uh, we map things, we look at land uses. Are the adjacent land uses appropriate? Do you want to build a sports stadium with bright lights in the backyard of residences? Probably not a good adjacent land use. Um, drainage patterns, we want to make sure we look at the drainage patterns, wetlands, rights of way and utilities. We did a park in Murraysville was crisscrossed with high pressure gas lines. It uh, pretty much prevented them from doing any development to the park. Vegetation, we want to be respectful of the vegetation that's there. Uh, riparian forest buffers, riparian being along a stream. Uh, existing use patterns, steep slopes, water bodies, floodplains. You can see those soils are very important. We need to look at the soils because the soils will determine the carrying capacity of the land. So if the soils are clay soils, which are common in this area, that's going to be an issue in terms of development. So once we've looked at what the existing land is in terms of what the areas are to protect and to preserve and to celebrate, we've also then conversely identified areas that are suitable for development. And so then we start to develop alternatives. And we develop, and that's what you're going to be doing tonight, is look at alternatives on this site plan and look at developable areas for where we can put roads and parking and facilities and natural areas and buffers and greenways. So we look at alternatives. Generally, we'll look at three or four different ways of doing There's lots of different ways to do it. And then eventually evolve through consensus building to the master plan. This one's in Independence Township in Beaver County. Finally, we need to tell you how to build it because very few communities can afford to build the entire park the first year. So then we start to look at ways of phasing logically the construction whether it's just infrastructure the first year and no one gets to see any improvements but there are lots of sewers, or whether you in fact try to build some facilities in the first year. So this is a, a phasing plan. So those are the steps of a master plan. Finally, it's important to understand when you want the park, what is it going to cost to operate that park? What are the revenue potentials so that you have a sense of what you're asking the community to, to take? So. We look at operating and costs and revenue opportunities. So are there any questions? I kind of went through that fast. But before we start into the next exercise, I would be interested in answering any questions you have about master planning or comprehensive planning or anything like that. Have I put everybody to sleep? Uh-oh, we're in trouble. I knew after dinner we'd be in trouble. Any questions? Please, Jan, thank you. <laughs> now that's a, a great question. First of all, the ones that get no dot are important. Every single item on that is somebody's idea of what's important in the community, and we need to reflect back some way what that is. I see the dots as a prioritization 
not a process of elimination. So something that doesn't get dots may not be as in great a demand, but is an, a, an important idea. Uh, and that's the whole idea of, of developing with trust in, in the community building. Um, when you get a lot of dots, if you get ideas that may have 15 or 20, and there might be six or seven of those, then you have to sort out whether there are other planning principles or the site that might drive whether one thing starts to become more an opportunity or less of an opportunity. So th that's one of those things. And, and then you have to sort out ultimately what the vision of the community is. Um, and I probably am speaking out of turn, and I don't shoot me. But I, the sense I got was that Mayview was not intended to be a major sports complex. That's the vision of this community. So even if soccer fields got the most dots on that thing, in the context of planning for Mayview, it would be my sense that, well, that's a need, that's a need that needs to be dealt, not at this site. So then we move on and look at the next group of high, highly ranked things and see if that fits our vision for that site. So that's how I would, I would say maybe sort out some of those issues. He's done. <laughs> um, did, did everyone hear? It's, it's a question of the difference. And, and I think the process of determining the need is the same, because you're both, both for a specific site, you're going to do a community-wide investigation of what the needs are for that site. But you're going to have the limitations of what that site can offer and how that fits in the vision. Well, you're starting off with a basic premise here, and that's that to do do any one site to start with a community-wide assessment of need and et cetera. Uh, that is my assumption. Building. That is your assumption. I want you to talk to that assumption. Gotcha. The pros and cons of that assumption. Does it not work without that? Can it work doing it some other way? It, can you have a successful park master plan? Yeah, I doing it in isolation. I obviously I prefer that you look at the entire community or even beyond the borders of the community as we look at partnering with other nearby communities. I would prefer that the needs of the entire community and the vision for the community be set so that you're not looking in isolation on that one parcel and then wondering how to meet community-wide needs, all of those needs, on one site. Because clearly there may be activities that are better suited for other sites, but if you're not looking at other sites, then you're limited to trying to assess whether the needs of the community can be met with the one site you're looking at. So the downside of doing that is, is that you're not really understanding how other areas within the community, either existing sites you don't have right now, might help meet the needs so that the one site that you're looking at doesn't have to try to meet all of the needs of the entire community. Have you seen examples where a master plan is done in isolation for a particular parcel, and if you have, has have it or they been successful, failures, or a mixed bag? Um, I'm going to give you a roundabout answer. The state of Pennsylvania, who funds these, recommends that you do the comprehensive plan and look at all the community things and needs before you do a master plan. So for example, if a community comes in and says, we'd like to do a master plan for a community park, the state will say, before we give you money for a master plan, we will ask you to do a comprehensive plan. And if people are in a real hurry to master plan their park because they want to do something for a specific park, they might even say, well, why don't you do a, what they call a hybrid, where you do a comprehensive plan, and then the outcome of that is going to be the master plan as a second component of that planning study. And you merge both processes together so you can do one public process, but actually address both issues. So the ideal world and the state is recognized enough that they are strongly encouraging people to do the community-wide planning first. I think there are examples where just a master plan, in fact, can be successful if the public process that's done for that master plan looks at the bigger picture issues and tries to sort out in a very cursory way whether other areas of the community can meet it without investing a lot of energy and time in that. Which state agency? 
BCNR, which funds most of the Keystone grants. And All right, um, let me tell you what you've got. We're going to ask you to break up into four tables, and we're going to break up the students. We need a couple students at each table, and, uh, and we need a, some people that can read maps at each of the tables. And you're going to have a number of things. Um, what I'd like to do is have you, this is the, the, the plan, this is a park a site for a park that you have on, on the table. So you can see a number of things. We've gone ahead and done the site analysis. So we've identified where steep slopes are, where poor soils are, where tree masses are, and we've then identified developable areas that are remaining. So we've tried to kind of give you that sense. So we've done the site analysis. So now you're ready to say, where do I put facilities on this park? And I'm hoping that you won't put too many facilities on the steep slopes or the wet soils or the, the tree masses. But that's also you, up to you to do. But you can put your wall hat on and just go right ahead. Um, we have programs at each table. And what I've done is I've, there are two different programs. There's one that's a, kind of a more of a natural environmental focused program. I've put that at two tables. And then I've put one that's more active park sports park kind of program. Um, and two tables have this. So you're, two of the tables are going to have similar program. They're, they're two different programs. So it'll be interesting as you report back as to the kinds of facilities and where you put them and how you did this. Um, what I've done is provided you with cartoons of each of a variety of facilities for you to put and tape onto the map. So what we're going to have you do are scissors and tape it and at each of these, so you're going to cut these out and put them down wherever you think it's appropriate. A few key things when you, you start to do this. If you try to do a sports field, I'd like you to put 200 foot buffer around each field. Now, uh, these scale, let me check, I think the scale is 100 scale. Yes. The scale is one inch equals 100 feet. So you need, whenever you put a, cut a field out, whether it's a soccer field or a baseball field, you need two inches around it before you can put the next facility. So give yourself two inch buffer around every facility. And that, that's real in terms of, of room for drainage waves or stormwater detention or, or other issues, parking and those kinds of things. Um, you'll see that the uh, field, the long, if you think about it, I hope, yes, north is to the top of the page. If you're going to put a soccer field, you need to put the soccer field so that north is going this way. So that when the sun goes across the field, the goalie in the soccer or lacrosse does not have to look into the sun. Baseball, ideally, you would like to have a line from home plate through second base pointed in a northeasterly direction. And with baseball, somebody's going to get hit probably because of the sun. But the thinking is, is that you don't want the batter or the pitcher to be blinded by the sun. The first baseman and the third baseman are blinded, but it depends on what day it is. But um, the I ideal orientation is to have generally this pointed in a northerly direction. If you have to, you can put it in a southerly direction, but ideally it was north. The idea is not to have the line from home plate through second going either east or west. We've also, you'll notice a couple other things. We've just shown you what a 100-foot buffer is. If you find a drainage way and you would like to protect that, here is a 100-foot buffer. Um, we've got playgrounds. We've got other kinds of activities to scale. We'd like you to just cut them out and put them in as, as, as you wish. When you want to put a road on, you can just take one of the markers and just draw the road on wherever you want to link things. The road becomes the kind of the frame, the skeleton of the park. So if you think about where the roads should go, you probably want to minimize the amount of road you have, but yet have access to all the facilities. So think about maybe first where a road might go and where you want to develop the park, and then where the facilities, and then start to figure out where you want the facilities, and come up with a rationale as to why you put the facilities where you do. And I'm hoping within each of these groups, you're discussing, yes, even arguing, over what you think should go and where it should go. And I think 
you'll all learn from that as you do that. And I'll come around and, and, and help you with that. Uh, please. The, the minimum distance, there's actually a, a line that you draw from home plate that's the kind of the foul ball zone, and it starts at 100 feet from home plate and runs parallel to the first baseline to first base, and then it angles into the foul pole line in the corner. So that is kind of defined as the uh, foul ball area. So you wouldn't want any parking closer than that line. But we've suggested you keep everything about 200 feet away. Yeah, it's a kind of a conservative approach there. Please. Absolutely, I would encourage you, if there's something you want, ask me what the size is or the orientation. Uh, I don't know if we have any courts on here, tennis courts or anything else. Well, we can dream it up. Okay. You fake it. Sure. The idea is to have some fun with it and explore the issues that you do about planning a park. You've got uh, about 25 minutes to do this. And then what I'd like is to have each of the four groups identify one person to report back why they did what they did and show the rest of the group what it is. So the last 10 minutes we'll go through and, and present the ideas that you've developed. So I'm hoping that you will break up and that, that everybody will kind of go to a different table and, and uh, let's see what happens. I'll get around to each of your tables. Any other questions? Okay, we have markers and scales and everything up here. I don't know because we didn't see the others, but oh, okay. Good point. <laughs> uh, we are to include in this um, map picnic groves with small playgrounds, a caretaker's house, sand volleyball courts, horsey pits, softball fields with batting cages, soccer fields, a group camping site, and a fire tower. Wolf out. Well, when we looked at our sites, we began to discuss among ourselves basically what was the highest point or at what point did we want to put the fire tower and um, we had a number of discussions did we want to go to the highest point or did we want to go to a central point that had some height to it which is what we did we went into the center here so that we could provide access to the site of basically the whole area from a more central site we also wanted to put the group camping site close to the fire tower because we thought that that was also an area where there was um, space to put that, but the fire tower provided uh, something for people to do. Uh, it's near a green space, and so there was, there was a place to go. Um, but then we had to put the more active sports in there, and we had to consider the distance around the fields that was necessary, but we needed to put roads in. Um, we hated to, uh, in a sense, mess up the place with roads, but you have to have access, which was necessary to get to the fire tower and the camping area. And so we did come in down here with the road. Uh, these roads do not have to be hard. Uh, they can be impervious substance, and so we considered that as we put this road in here. Uh, on this side, okay, that's all right. So we were probably uh, pretty representative of most uh, community groups. We had a, a little bit of milling around, people just sort of starting to pick up things, cut out uh, stuff, um, look at the map. And as we, um, started to look over the requirements and started to cut out the pieces and move them around, we really had a strong sense that there were far too many uh, requirements for uh, the uh, site. So we actually cut, cut them back, um, um, what, in half? Just about in half. And then we actually started to work backwards 
saying that, A, we have too many requirements, but what are the kinds of things that are important to us? And um, we decided that open space was important to us, but also trying to provide at least the requested um, items. And we wanted those items to be um, uh, more centralized um, towards the outer edges. So those are the kinds of things we looked at. <laughs> most of our uh, little, most of our little tastes and things uh, kind of came off. We also conclude. Sure, excellent, excellent. We also had the active recreation facilities, and we also concluded that there was far, far too many things uh, to go on here than the site would stand. So what we ended up doing was taking the size of the piece and saying, all right, where does it go on here? Where is there a physical place to put it? And that's why we ended up overlapping fields here. We had some problems with the neighbors over here because we didn't want to put too many facilities right next to the neighbors. We had a little trouble with parking. You can see we ended up with the parking all over here and some fields and stuff down here. So the roads that you see here are intended to be I guess we describe them as golf cart kind of roads as opposed to driving kind of roads. And the campground is way off here in the distance because anybody who's going to go camping can certainly hike into this lake. Thank you very much. Booth number four. Who's going to I'm going to talk about the three Ds, diplomacy, democracy, and I just lost the third one. But uh, as we approached the map, uh, we were all diplomatic about offering. So we held back, and then we just jumped on in. Started cutting, started placing, started rearranging. Uh, the act of placement and discussion, that was the third D, discussion. We actively involved in discussion countering each thought with a counter th uh, with another thought saying how about here how about there and the park evolved um, with concerns for the neighboring communities three-fourths of this area was private residence so we were really respective of their need and also the access we wanted it reduced to a minimum I think we only accessed the park perhaps maybe 50 yards in between the two fields and left all the rest to trails. Uh, we green areas uh, both streams as well, so those were green spaces. Just sit down for well, about three minutes. Um, it, br it was brought to my attention. We talked about a comprehensive recreation park and open space plan, which is totally different than a comprehensive plan. And I wanted to make a distinction for those of you before you left the room, the di what difference between a comprehensive plan is a community-wide vision for land use, transportation, zoning, um, usually housing includes all the cultural features in a community. That's a, what's a comprehensive plan. What we're talking about tonight is a comprehensive recreation park and open space plan, which deals with one aspect of the broader community, which is recreation parks and open space. So I wanted to make a distinction that you went out and you said, well, we talked about a comprehensive plan. We talked about a comprehensive recreation park and open space plan. We did not talk about a comprehensive plan. I'll be glad to come back and do that some other time. Um, theming. I, I want to mention when we do these plans, I like to think about themes. I think they add to richness. And I brought an example of a theme. This is a playground at Riverview Park, one of the regional parks in the city of Pittsburgh. Happened to have an observatory in the top of the hill at the park. And so we developed a playground we were at. And we, the backbone of that was a comet's tail, because Haley's Comet was going through at the time we designed it. So we had a, we had a tail of a comet 
this gave the structure for the playground for the older kids. The role of the, the observatory, I don't know if you know much about observatories, every observatory in the world is given an assignment. This is assignment is to measure distance between stars in certain parts of the solar system. And so we created a sun sitting area and then paths to stars with distance and light years put in the pathway uh, with stainless steel letters. So you could start to learn about the distance to the stars and the role of this observatory in the big picture of, of looking at the solar system. We have a crescent moon up here with some quotes. That's theming a park, and so we think it's oftentimes adds a richness of education to what is typically a playground. Um, one last, I always like to end with a quote, and, and so if you could just think of this, um, we can't change the past, but we can learn from it and build on it. We can't control the future, but we can shape and enhance the possibilities for our children and grandchildren, and that's what you're doing tonight with this time. So thank you very much. Any questions?